So hi, everybody. My name is Alexia. Uh, being the thing between you and drinks is not a place any lawyer wants to be for too long. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet. We usually want to be at the drinks. Um, so I, my name is Alexia. I'm from a media law boutique in New York. Why am I here? I'm here because what we do is help people like the people in this room and outside of this room do what you're doing in a legally safe way or help you decide how much risk you're willing to take because that's also an option. What are we going to talk about? How many people here have dealt with in their careers with at least one of the words up here on the screen? Five of the words on the screen? Ten of the words on the screen? The point being that as exciting and novel and new as the technologies and the products that we're all working on are, unfortunately, the old school regimes apply. And so we're going to touch upon a few of these issues in a very high level way, no case law, nothing, just as an uh, issue spot so that at least you have these little triggers so that the next time something similar happens, hopefully it just helps you remember this is something I should think about. The first topic is protecting your ideas and your product. Ideas versus expression. I often hear people say, but I can't believe he stole my idea. I copyrighted it, or I, I own it. It's my copyright. Unfortunately not, right? Ideas are not protected by copyright. The translation of that idea, the expression of that idea, once it's in a tangible medium, that's what's protected. So if you're talking about how to protect your ideas, your methods, your processes, we're talking about patents. If you want to talk about the actual product, once you have something tangible, that's copyright. Why is it so important as of last year to register for copyright? It's because now, if you haven't registered for copyright, you cannot sue for copyright infringement in federal court. So as soon as you've got something tangible now, you should go and file. It's not expensive. Go do it online and file a copyright registration, because down the line, you'll need that registration to sue if you ever need to sue. Your ideas, another way of protecting them. A lot of people here have wonderful ideas that they want to pitch, they want to get funding for. And it's so easy, unfortunately, to get those ideas and whatever you're pitching your deck stolen from you because they're brilliant ideas. So what can you do? Your best option, get them to sign a non-disclosure agreement. That can be very difficult, especially if you're you know, a small fish going up against a big dog. They're going to say no. So what can you do instead? Be smart about the way that you're pitching your ideas. If you are pitching your ideas to your employers, chances are you've signed something before that says that whatever you do, they own. So do these things on your own time. Do them on your personal computer. When you're asking for the email to meet, send it from your personal email. Suggest to meet off your office property so that you're building as much of an argument as you can, that there was an implied contract between the two of you or understanding that you were not doing this in the course of your business and that you were pitching something that was going to be that you owned and confidential. Patents, we said briefly, that's not something I go into because it's not something, ooh, excuse me, that I work on, but I can, you know, we can refer you to other lawyers that do. Trademark, your brand, it is one of the most important things today. Your name, your logo, your designs, those are things that you can trademark now. And you can do that before you actually start. You can file what's called an intent to use application. And you just have to say in good faith that you intend to use it. So before your product is even out there, Start using business cards with the name. Start sending emails that have the name in it. Start showing that you have this intent to use and file an intent to use application so that before you're even in business, the trademark's yours. And that's really important because if somebody challenges you down the line or you want to challenge somebody that's using it, you've had this application from a long time ago. And finally, work for hire agreements. That word is up there on the screen because it's just something I want you to remember. Whenever you're signing a contract and you're rendering services for somebody, look for those words. Because if those words are in that agreement, in plain English, it means that the person you're working with owns everything you do. And if that's not what you want, then make sure it's not a work for hire. Now, designing your content. What are some things to think about that you're putting inside your content? Copyright. If you're using, whether it's a photograph, a painting, a song, a sculpture, some people don't know that, a stamp, um, anything that's potentially protected by copyright. If you're putting someone else's content in yours, what are your options? You could pay for it, which better if you don't. And so if you don't, you can fair use it. 
what's fair use? Fair use is this doctrine and copyright that allows you to use content that somebody else created, that somebody else owns the copyright to, because the law deems that it's a fair use, because they want to encourage this kind of use. What is a fair use? It is a very amorphous concept. There are certain factors that the court looks to, but there's no magic rule for what it is. But the rule of thumb is that you've transformed it. Now, what does it mean to transform it? Unfortunately, augmenting something, taking a painting and making it into AR, in and of itself, might not be transformative. Transformative, you're really thinking, are you taking somebody's copyrighted content and doing something to it that gives it a new meaning, a new purpose? So for example, if you just augment the whole Hungry Caterpillar book, that might not be transformative. But for example, if you take photographs, let's say your app, and you're showing people by scanning in London, they can see different famous photographs that were taken there. Um, and there's descriptions, and it tells you about it, and it tells you how the area's changed since then, and you're referring to the picture, you're going to have a lot stronger fair use argument than just the picture in and of itself. Going back, if I can, right of publicity. Let's say you have an app where you walk around. There's a couple of New Yorkers in this room. A lot of famous people live in New York. You hold your phone up to buildings, and it shows you the people who live there, and you have George Clooney's name and his face, and you sell that app on the app store for money, you are potentially going into the territory of infringing on George Clooney's right of publicity, which is his right to control how his likeness and his name is exploited commercially. So that's one thing to think about if you're involving people whose reputation have commercial value in your products. And finally, last but not least, libel. You have you know, products where you hold up your phone, and let's say it tells you if a product was ethically made or not. Let's say you do that for a product, you say it wasn't, but in fact it was. If you have statements of fact in your product, you want to make sure they're true and accurate, or you risk potentially defaming someone. So that's something to think about as well. Your content in the real world. I have to talk about Pokemon Go and trespass because it's been a question that comes up so often. Is it a trespass to put your marker on somebody's private property? As of today, and this could change, to just put your marker on somebody's private property in and of itself is not an act of trespass. A lot of people sued Pokemon, a class action, by trying to say that with Pokemon Go, they were committing trespass. As many of you might know, that settled, and so we don't have an answer on that point. But even if right now it's not a trespass in and of itself, two things to think about. One, you might still be creating a nuisance, right? If you put your marker on someone's private property and you're encouraging and causing people to jump over people's fences so that they can go and catch those Pokemon, then you're potentially going into the realm of nuisance. And the other thing to think about is you want to be a good actor, right? As part of the settlement, what Pokemon did is they said that they were going to put a mechanism on their website, <clears throat> excuse me, a mechanism on their website where if you had a marker near your house, you can go and come register a complaint. And they say that they'll make an effort to make that go away. Um, they've said that they now have an, uh, a pop-up that says if they have too many people congregating, you know, be a good person, don't trespass. And so that's another thing to think about. It's not just legal considerations, but it's how can we be good actors in this space as well. And speaking about good actors, biometric data. We heard a lot today about glasses, which means that we're going to be scanning people's faces. We're going to be scanning their eyes, maybe. You might have other apps where you're scanning hand geometry. <clears throat> what does all of that mean? That's all biometric data. And that's become more of an issue recently because even though there's no federal law, so copyright is federal. It applies to you no matter what state you're in. There are a number of states that now have specific privacy statutes for biometric data. Washington, Illinois, and Texas. The one to really think about and be careful is Illinois because Illinois applies whether you're scanning for commercial or non-commercial uses. So let's say you have an app where you can, uh, at the time of the Super Bowl, scan your friend's face and you have the color of the team. And you're not doing anything commercial with it. It's just for fun. The Illinois statute would still apply, which means that we've seen, and Google never went on the record saying this was why, but when Google had their app where you could scan your face and it would find your um, famous art doppelganger, it wasn't rolled out in Illinois. They never said why, but you can put two and two together it's not an unfair assumption to say that they probably didn't want to deal with the Illinois statute. 
So a good rule of thumb for biometric data, thinking about being a good actor, is collect what you ask for. If you have a disclosure at the beginning of your product and people agree and consent, chances are you're, you're putting much better chances of being in the clear. That's the, the most simplistic summary of all the statutes that I can give. And last but not least, advertising and endorsements. One of the wonderful things that AR can do is augment our environment, give us tips, try this restaurant, go here, this is the menu for this place. If this restaurant is coming up on your app, on your product, because they're endorsing you or because they're paying you, your users have to know. So there would have to be a disclosure that comes up at the same time somewhere on the screen that says, you know, Johnny's is, an endor you know, is, a, is a paid sponsor for this product. Um, or if you're creating, we also see, we've seen a lot of experiences today where you might not know if the product was sponsored by, say, Coca-Cola or Nestle or Dove, and it's not totally clear. Anything that might be an, um, an advertisement, but that's not clear, you have a responsibility as the content creator to disclose that it is an advertisement. Otherwise, you risk running afoul of a group called the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, which is the body that regulates all of this in the United States. And you can get a big slap on the wrist and a big fine if you are not clear um, with your disclosures that things are ads and or endorsed. And so with all of that, I hope you feel not alarmed but empowered that these are all issues that you can spot, right? Like you see it, you know it when you see it. If you've got your little spidey senses tingling that maybe this something's off, maybe this is gonna piss someone off, check. Search on Google, speak to a lawyer, do something, but you should feel empowered because these are, they're the First Amendment protects content creators like the people in this room to do a lot of things. So it's not a question of what these legal obstacles are, it's just knowing how to navigate them so you can get to where you wanna be. Thank you very much.